Welcome in behalf of TechSoup Europe. My name is Kasia. Uh, as I said, I welcome you from our Warsaw office, which is um, TechSoup headquarters uh, for Europe uh, region. Uh, TechSoup helps civil society organizations all around the world um, connect to the best technology for social change. So if you are looking for resources, tools, trainings, services that can help you with your digital transformation, please reach out to TechSoup. If you're a grant maker, uh, funder, donor, we can also connect you with uh, civil society organizations uh, all the, around the world. And today, and through, together with our guests, we're going to demystify artificial intelligence. And before we start, a few uh, housekeeping rules. As you can see, all of you are um, muted. There are no cameras. This is like a webinar mode on Zoom. So you can only see and listen, but you can communicate with us uh, via chat that you already used. And if you'd like to ask a question, please use Q&A um, panel. Type, type your questions there. There will be time uh, to answer all of them. Uh, and don't worry, uh, we record the meeting and everything will be available later on. Uh, you will receive the email if you are registered for this webinar uh, or follow our social media because we are also live on Facebook. So this is the beginning. Now, Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kasha. And welcome everybody to our conversation on AI today. It is a pleasure to be joined by Alice, the Managing Director at AI for Good, John, the Senior Advisor of Tech for Development and Innovation at Save the Children, and all of his Save the Children friends who are here today, and Rudra Deb, the Founder and CEO of Omdena. Why host this call? Well, AI is a big topic from the generalized AI that we see in movies to chatbots that we talk to online. Sometimes they're very annoying. There are reasons to be excited, like being able to distill scent out of all that data in the world. For instance, a foundation that I've done some work with that was using machine learning to go through 25 years of their reports, read them, and start distilling some sense across 25 years of grant making about what they'd actually done, who they'd actually been able to serve. It was in multiple languages. It would have been fantastically hard for a human to do that work. There are some great stories that we'll hear from some of the folks here today about NGO perspectives on why to be excited. <clears throat> and of course, there are reasons to be concerned. Militarized chatbots messing with democracies and deliberative processes around the world lack of data from marginalized communities, historically disenfranchised communities, leading to poor automated decision-making. If you're interested in that topic, Virginia Eubanks' book, Automating Inequality, is a fascinating read on what can go wrong when governments try to create better government services using AI, but they don't have the data reflecting the communities they intend to serve. I'm gonna ask everybody joining here today on the panel about hey, I, how AI manifests in their lives, why they're excited or concerned in an effort to help us all gain better insight into some of what AI practically means today. <clears throat> and that's really the core of this conversation. I've seen funders, governments, the EU, all sorts of people getting really excited about AI. I remember, it, and it reminded me of probably six, eight years ago when you couldn't go to an NGO conference without big data for good being all over the panels. But did anybody have big data? And then four years ago, blockchain for good. But did anybody know what blockchain really meant? There was a lot of time and effort. Some, yes, of course people did. I'm being slightly sarcastic, but I think you get the point. There was a lot of time and effort sunk into the conversation without a lot of practical grounding in how most NGOs or foundations might actually think about AI, think about blockchain, think about these emerging technologies and what they actually meant. So that's really what I'd like to get into today. You know, I, I would prefer this to not be, you know, the year of AI that doesn't happen in a meaningful way when there are those good things to be excited about. So jumping right in, I'm curious from our panelists' perspective, when 
we asked this question about how does AI actually manifest in your work? What does AI actually look like? When I say, you know, Alice, AI, specific example, what does it look like when AI appears in what you're trying to do? Yes, sure. Um, so hi, my name is Alice. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction <laughs> to the session, Chris. Uh, so for us, obviously, like uh, AI is um, something that we do in the area of chatbots and uh, language specifically. So obviously, we started in this field um, very like early on by just working with charities, trying to identify what is this one issue for them. Um, kind of like really necessary and really pressing to be solved in the next couple of years. And like, usually they would say that, you know, we have overwhelming amounts of like demand, especially now during COVID, you know, calls and, um, you know, requests to their uh, different systems that they use to manage their organizations. It's just like impossible to handle. And uh, chatbots is one way to kind of scale it and to extend their reach to the people that they're trying to help and that they need, uh, you know, to surf at this difficult time. Um, again, one of the biggest problems that they would usually mention is like triage and being able to quickly identify whether the person needs like urgent help immediately right now or whether they just need attention and just like, you know, nice conversation. <laughs> um, and to be honest, like the funny thing about the chatbots is like, even though they're like bots, so they're programs and uh, robots usually, um, and we call it this way, uh, they are still very nice to you know open up to because they don't judge you um, and they can be designed to just like you know pay attention to every single detail in your conversation and if you're flagging something that is really kind of like uh, serious and and should you know you should take some action about it uh, they can immediately like signpost you to some help uh, that you require uh, even if you don't understand it sometimes. <laughs> so obviously in our case, chatbots is the way to extend the reach of the organization is to increase its uh, impact and its capacity and hopefully like, you know, accelerate the impact that they're trying to make in this difficult time. Um, so yeah, so that would be my, my version of AI, <laughs> I would say. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think a lot of people forget that chatbots are a critical form of AI that can help with exactly as you're saying, the overwhelming demand upon civil society and making sure that you can talk to a human when you really need to talk to a human. At TechSoup, a lot of the time that somebody forgot their password. That's a lot of the phone calls we get. Do we really need a human picking up the phone to help you reset your password? Eh, maybe, but it takes away time that somebody could answer a really critical technology question. So thank you. Chatbots, great example. John. I'm curious, you know, you're with Save the Children working on these issues. What's a specific example you might give us? Sure, a uh, uh, very concrete example actually was in a project we worked on with Ruderbed's organization, Ordena, um, where one of Save the Children's uh, focus areas is to protect children uh, in uh, any environment where we find them, including the digital environment. And uh, a, a huge problem that has grown since the internet has been uh, introduced and, and since it's been available in the communities we work in is uh, the distribution of child sexual abuse materials or which we call CSAM, otherwise known as child pornography. Um, so CSAM has grown 15,000% between 2005 and 2020. So it's been growing exponentially, it still is. Uh, it, the the uh, FBI estimates that at any one point in time, 750,000 adults are looking for almost all men, for, for children, for sexual reasons. Um, then COVID hit and we had more than 1.5 billion children uh, displaced from their schools. Uh, so it was sort of the perfect storm. We, we went from uh, exponential growth to a situation where all of a sudden the children were home uh, during the day with much more exposure to the internet. Uh, so we, we talked with Omdena about creating a project to use artificial intelligence and other, other uh, data science techniques to explore the phenomenon 
uh, and to see what we could do about it. Uh, and an example of, of what we did is we, uh, when Dana put together a group of over 40 people, data scientists from around the world who basically scoured the internet, great social media, news articles, academic articles, um, in order to help us understand what was happening. And one of the concrete outcomes of that was creation, again, of a chatbot. Uh, this was a, a chatbot that, well, we, we had uh, developed a technology to look at chats that children were having on different, different uh, platforms like games, for instance, and to early in a chat identify whether it was grooming behavior. So, so that the chatbot can step in basically, or we can, uh, we can uh, trigger an event. So the chat can be shut down, uh, a, a reviewer, human reviewer could come into the chat. Uh, and it's something that we're working on now. Now we're looking at other technologies that, that we can integrate it with. Uh, and and uh, it's a new tool that hasn't been available before that now we're able to, um, to assume we'll be able to deploy in commercial settings. Thanks, John. Um, another, that, that's a, there's a lot that you said there that's a really hard topic and using AI and machine learning to help target interventions again, really, I think a, another good example of that, similar to Alice's in some ways about sort of channeling our ability to help people in the right time in the right way. Um, Roger Deb, I say AI, you say what? If you could come off mute and <laughs> what, what does AI practically mean to you and your work building communities around AI practitioners? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris, for inviting me, first of all. Um, so I will briefly tell about Omdena, which uh, John referred to. So Omdena is a platform to build AI solutions, and we believe the best way to build the solutions is to engage the global community, people who are often affected by those problems to come together, collaborate for a given period of time and build the solutions. And since we started 20 months ago, we have done 45, 46 projects. Uh, so it's quite a lot of space to cover, but I think what I will uh, talk about perhaps one or two examples. Um, one example that I would like to bring about is the work we did with uh, World Resource Institute. Um, where one of the, the, the key challenge of any NGO or in this particular case was to understand the well-being of people. And in this case, whereas in India, uh, we wanted to, they wanted to understand how well people are. The standard way to do that process currently is through you know, doing a service. And that often happens 10 years, once in 10 years, like you know, Indian government does that. That's outdated, that's like, you know, um, and it's very expensive. And they came to us and said, hey, can we actually use satellite images to understand the well-being of people rather than you know, just doing the survey once in 10 years and kind of uh, you know, the data is old and expensive. And we actually built the first version of that model, which was I think almost 70% accurate, 65 to 70% accurate, which correctly being able to predict the well-being of the people just to use it looking at the satellite images. Now, what does that mean looking at satellite images? I mean. You can imagine that satellite images represent a kind of places that people live, right? The roads, the roofs, whether they have toilet facilities or not, the kind of vegetation that they have, they all, that all affects the well-being. And we were able to build a model, classification model, which was looking at a, uh, a part of India and saying, oh, this, whether, uh, how well the, the people are. And that was, we then verified that with actual data and it was 70% accurate. And that work actually then got funding um, and then continued working on that. So this is the fifth month that we are working with them and, and we were to keep on refining the model. Um, the second example that I will tell is uh, work we did with ISS in Switzerland. And that's again, a very interesting case. It's a 97 year old organization and they work a lot with child uh, you know, cases, uh, not exactly say the children, but more on child support and kind of international cases and things like that. And it was a purely group of people who are non-technical who, who just, I had a call with the CEO and he said, you know, we are very keen to use this technology, but we don't know. We even have very little amount of data. And, and again, got a global community came together. They were able to deliver some very tangible results that that organization was able to use. Primarily that when they get a new case, it was able to 
give a very clear set of actions that what the actions that the system will recommend for a let's say a social worker to take um, based on the, a given case. Um, and of course, John did a great job in explaining the work that we did to save the children. So I think that kind of covers a couple of the cases that we have worked on. Thanks. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the where you ended up there as well with sort of the recommendation engine side of things and helping people, I think, iterate towards AI is the, the nature of my next set of questions that I would have, which is sort of, what does it take to get there? You know, this, this capacity to have better decision making, this capacity to drive insight, um, you know, some of the promise of the examples that you've talked about to channel people with chatbots and help, again, target service and intervention in the right ways at the right times. Getting there, you, you said, uh, Rujadeb, that, you know, your first model around the project in India was at like 70, 60 to 70 percent accurate. And now you're iterating towards the next model. I'm curious if each of you might sort of share some thoughts for an audience, you know, for people who've joined us here today who might be just like the folks at ISS. They're joining because they're interested in AI and sort of defining what that means for themselves. How, how, how do NGOs start down the path towards building and leveraging AI tools, AI projects? Where, what do you, uh, I'll throw that, you're, you're still on mic, Rujadeb. So you're up first. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, so for anyone who wants to, one of my key advice to people when they want to go into the AI journey is I say, don't go into the AI journey if you really don't have to go to the AI journey. Because, you know, there are a lot of uncertainties into going into that journey and trying to explore certain things. But if you are convinced or if you think that you want to know whether AI or machine learning is good for you, machine learning, to be very honest, it's nothing really intelligent. It's basically identifying patterns in, in the data and trying to um, build a model that uh, that kind of models the patterns in data, right? So that's all it is. So if you think any of your, in your day-to-day -day work, that there are that are, that are repeated, that are, there are patterns in that, that potentially either that you can see or there are things that you might think that you can have. For example, like the satellite image data that I said, that someone said, it might make sense that based on the well-being of the people, we will be able to analyze the satellite image and that might be able to tell that. So, so it all comes from a human intelligence or a human intuition or expert telling that um, there are these potential some patterns that we might want to see if we can model those patterns that can represent the work that is being done. And then once you model that in a machine, then you can I use that to prevent things uh, or to predict things. And that's just the use of that model. Um, but that's where I think it all starts from a human expert thinking through, are there patterns in my work, in what I'm doing? Potentially that could be then modeled in a, in a, in a machine and then can use it to, 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 to do my job better. That's super helpful. I think for all of us to think about because we are experts in our work in civil society, we, we know our space very well. And to be able to ground our thinking into what are those patterns? What are those places where we might want a little help. <laughs> so Alice, um, I'm curious from your perspective, I know something you and I've talked about over time, for instance, is helping people begin not with, if they didn't have data, like if they didn't really have enough, how do they start aggregating and moving towards it? Yeah, I can just uh, give you like a step-by-step -step <laughs> explanation and data is a big, big part in this like pipeline, but uh, we usually start with human-centered design. So for us, it's really important before we come up with any solution um, to A, understand the human point of view. So we put human in the center and human is something that we call the end user or the beneficiary, how like a lot of charities, uh, you know, used to call their um, clients, I would say. <laughs> uh, so basically in our case, we try to like hear as, as much as, you know, possible in terms of, you know, their experience, their, you know, needs, their problems, like the details, the contextual details of how they face the difficulties in like service provision. And it doesn't matter which service it is. It's really important to understand what exactly is broken in that, you know, link of things. 
um, but also to hear it not just from the charity point of view, but also from the user perspective. Um, and this is like why it's really important to start with a human in the human center design process or design thinking process. Uh, then we move to like, you know, problem definition and obviously like putting some hypothesis for the problem. So I know it's like, a, you know, a word that, you know, a lot of data scientists and machine learning um, try to use before they start on any project. And to be honest, uh, it's really important to come up with, you know, one idea, but then also to test and verify it. So for example, for our chatbot uh, called Rainbow, which is designed for uh, survivors of abuse and violence uh, in South Africa, we actually went to South Africa, we partnered with a charity, uh, and we obviously always partner with a subject matter expert uh, for any kind of intervention. But in this case, specifically, we wanted to get access to these people who experienced abuse, get their point of view, like understand what is the actual problem? Because we had a hypothesis that the problem is reporting uh, because this is how, you know, the data <laughs> is talking about the problem. Um, right now in the research, you will see that reporting is massively um, kind of like, like important and it's lacking in any kind of like area in any um, country as well. Uh, but then we realized after reading the interviews with the people who actually experience abuse that a bigger issue is realization that what's happening to them is not normal. It's not okay. They should do something about it. There are organizations that can help them with that. So this sheer kind of like realization became the, the overall problem for Rainbow <laughs> to solve. And this is when we kind of launched the first version of the bot, which was very simple. We only use like a nature language uh, processing mechanism to just identify the keywords that would um, kind of like show us that the person is um, in emergency situation and they need urgent help right now. So quote, like, you know, if they would say the word kill or suicide or domestic violence or abuse, this type of words. Um, so this is when we deployed the first version of the chatbot uh, in 2018. And we gathered a lot of data to then improve on it. So later on, we added like um, nature language understanding capability, which is slightly more advanced. <laughs> and obviously it understands the context around. So not just the words, not just the simple um, kind of like uh, combination of letters, but the actual meaning of the phrase. When people talk about abuse and violence, we realize that people don't use any of these words that I mentioned before. They actually talk about it in a very subtle way. Um, so yeah, so for, for the algorithm to be able to recognize it, it's actually a much harder job. So in you know, providing safeguarding for us, it's really, really important that we keep you know, iterating and we keep kind of like looking at the data, looking at the conversations and improving the way we are um, kind of like gathering this conversation and analyzing it. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of iterative process. This is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that, that's really helpful. And I think um, a, a great compliment to what Richard Depp was saying, you know, you, you have the experts within civil society, but then you also have all the people that we intend to serve who are experts in their own pain points. They know, they know their lives and being able to strike that balance, do the design from both sides, get your hypotheses, test them, understand them and grow. I mean, ultimately, like all technologies, we would want this stuff used, right? If we're going to make the investment, we want people to use it. So you don't want to get it wrong by not having checked your facts. John, what about you? Um, yeah, you've been so, through this process, yeah. Right, building on what Anna said, uh, the, in my opinion, the subject matter experts are the key. If, if I can have subject matter experts or data scientists, I take the subject matter experts who understand what online abuse is, where it's happening. Um, but the magic happens when you put them together. Um, and that's true of technology for development in general. So we would we have the experts in online child abuse identify areas where we might find data, uh, then the, the, uh, the data scientist team would go out and look for how they can get that data. And they'd, they'd look for public sources. If they were private sources, we would have to approach the organizations that have those in order to obtain them. And, uh, and then we needed them to help uh, interpret the data because you, you, you need a lot of quality data, but no matter how much data you have, you you, you someone who understands the context in order to be able to understand it, 
and then to do something about it. So it wouldn't be helpful if you could have found a beta and look for that. Um, but being able to uh, use not just AI, but, but different techniques in order to shape that data in a way that can be understood uh, in our case, which, which it sounds like Alice was using also, uh, in order to understand the details about how people talk, how, how groomers uh, who, who uh, are, are violent against children talk so that we could identify nuance, nuance the potential for violence of each line and, and we're, then we're calculating with the sum totals of those lines what the um, chance is that that's going to turn into what we would call violence against children. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate the keeping humans in the AI discussion, um, <clears throat> especially until AI is truly intelligent. I think the, the human role that you all speak to it's something I think about a lot. Um, I was in a discussion recently with a foundation who's super excited to fund AI. And I said, well, fund what? And they said that they really wanted to fund um, algorithmic transparency efforts. And I said, but who are you funding? Well, we're funding NGOs to get into algorithmic transparency. And I said, you know, no offense, but how many NGOs do you currently fund and know that can read an algorithm? They were like, hmm. Not, not so many. And then, okay, well, I'm not saying that there aren't NGOs out there who can't, but I think to the point of the humans and the subject matter expertise within civil society, being able to participate on the front end of algorithmic design, and then on the back end, understanding the impacts on communities and iterating the way that Alice and Richard Ebb and John all just spoke about, like that's a place to invest, understanding sort of the inputs and the outputs of AI some people should absolutely be in the middle too but i think our sensitivities on both ends are critical the 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 algorithm in the middle is a methodology it's a tool so last two things that i was hoping to address today and you know please do uh for folks who've joined us today throw in some questions and uh things you might want to learn about as we get through the last couple of questions the first question is really are there, are there, is there an example from each of you or any of you, something that you see in AI, something that you see within civil society that gets you really excited? Is there something you've seen that really you're excited or inspired about? And then the other question is, are there things that you don't feel like civil society writ large that we're not talking about? Things that concern you, areas where we need to be thinking more so that we can be learning more. So particular topics that we just haven't invested enough time to learn. Um, so I'll, I'll throw it open to any of you on either of those questions, something you're really excited about or an area where you think we need to learn more, maybe partner better. John? Yeah, I can jump in there on the second one, uh, which is easy to misinterpret results. So like I was saying, you can scrape whatever you want, put there, uh, large databases, and that doesn't get you the understanding that you need. So, and a, a practical example of that is in our project, uh, we, we scraped um, from, from like seven countries, uh, many thousands of news articles that mentioned different words that we associated with, with online violence against children. And we, we realized during that process that it doesn't really tell you that much except for the popularity of that topic in the press in the country that, that where we scrape the news. Because if you think about it, and uh, there have been some cases that, that have been awful, so have received a lot of press, for instance, in the Philippines. Uh, so we'll get a lot of articles about about um, online violence against children in the, in the Philippines. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are higher incidences of, of online violence in the Philippines. It just means there have been a lot of articles about it. 
And, and another thing to think about is during, during these lockdowns uh, induced by COVID, there, everyone became aware that this could be a risky, uh, risky situation for children. Uh, and people started talking about grooming as uh, there, there's much more potential for grooming online. And uh, so journalists started to write articles about that. And so if you look at the data from news articles, you, would, you could say that grooming shot up suddenly in March of 2020. But uh, it, pro it, it probably did rise, but not at the steep curve that we see from the data from, from news articles, because we were just writing about that and reading about that at that time. It wasn't that grooming wasn't happening before. Thank you. Is there anything you're excited about, John? I am. Uh, without being able to access this, this uh, large amount of publicly available data, we wouldn't understand the issue as much and we, we wouldn't be able to build tools to, to fight online violence. So, and, and it wasn't easy to get this data. It, the, the real AI techniques were in finding the data analyzing it and, and again, humans were involved in, in spending tremendous numbers of hours cleaning it uh, so that we could, we, we could use uh, NLP and other techniques to, to analyze it. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do that on Excel spreadsheets uh, or with, you know, even the, the people we have on staff as good as they are in, in use of data we didn't really have the talent uh, to use AI in order to uncover that kind of information. And so this project really opened my eyes to what we can do uh, and, and I think is, is uh, generating a lot of potential for us to get more involved in the fight against online violence in CSAM. Thanks. Alice? Yes. Uh Thank you. It's, it's really hard to talk about, you know, <laughs> anything after John's uh, first point. Um, to be honest, uh, what I'm really excited about, and I'm really kind of like, you know, I can see it with my eyes and I'm like, oh, wow, it's happening finally. <laughs> so it's definitely a lot more um, data for good initiatives, uh, which is really, really nice to see because it gives us, you know, the tech sector. Um, the ability to actually bring some value and kind of like uh, some insights to experiment with the data, show the value of like this technology in the field. Um, and obviously, you know, when dealing with such an important issue, like, you know, the current pandemic, um, you know, the collaboration that is happening between, you know, different sectors, but also public and private organizations, you know, non-governmental organizations and um, tech companies. It's amazing. It's just like really something that, you know, keeps me going every day. Um, and I really hope, you know, like Ruder Dib and uh, his amazing community of Amdina, um, you know, a technologist would, you know, show us even more case studies so that A, we kind of like build more kind of opportunities out there in the sector so people see that you know there's so many ways you can use your data so many ways you can uh, use this technology to actually make some real impact and uh, make people's lives better um, by preventing some huge disasters or like you know uh, trying to build resilience uh, against them when they're already here um, I really want us to kind of like trust more <laughs> AI but at the same time don't kind of like misplace this trust, uh, which I think might be, you know, quite a difficult concept. But basically, um, you know, we've seen, you know, AI being used in drug discovery and vaccine discovery during COVID. So it's kind of like the scientific approach that usually wins <laughs> when we want to build trust. But at the same time, you know, we don't um, have to, you know, 
completely rely on this technology and automate everything to it because human in the loop is very very important especially when you know there's like false negative <laughs> so something that ai cannot identify because you know we humans can see it because because of our, our experience and um, ai is still kind of like a, an algorithm a machine that was designed by us so might have some flaws so let's not just overly rely on it as well um, and at the same time, what I really like about the sector is that um, A, we have really diverse data. So, you know, there's like a lot of talk about bias in AI. And unlike any commercial applications <laughs> where you have mostly white people using it, I'm sorry <laughs> for direct explanation, mostly men, mostly designed for those people because it was designed by you know, a team of technologists made out of those people. Obviously in the civil uh, society, in the social sectors, there's no such thing, <laughs> you know, the data is very diverse, the groups of people working on uh, these tools are very diverse. I'm happy that all the charities are usually represented by the people that have actually experienced this firsthand. Um, and it's it's evolving, you know, it's, it's definitely like bringing a lot more positive examples for um, AI application to the sector. So I hope, you know, commercial sector will see it and will even collaborate more and, uh, you know, invest more money into social um, tech. So yeah, that's my hope. And in terms of the bad stuff or like, you know, a little bit of concerns, I would also mention that um, we need uh, to kind of think about explainability. So Again, talking about over relying on this technology. Uh, sometimes we want to go for the best, you know, the best uh, algorithm out there because it's the most accurate and it's the most sophisticated one. We build like a huge system, right? That we don't really understand ourselves. Um, even as technologists, sometimes we cannot explain what's going on in that black box. Um, so I think, you know, in the social sector, let's maybe first use like the very simple approach. <laughs> Try to understand that first and then slowly move into better, 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 better. But as we move along this kind of like betterment and iteration, we also need to improve our understanding of this technology. And if we don't understand it and we cannot explain the results of this processing, let's maybe, you know, avoid using it for now because it might lead to some unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I remember being at a conference about big data a few years back and someone saying we were sort of like cave people in our relationship with big data and at the time it was sort of like you know initially it's like oh this is warm and pretty and then oh it's got utility it cooks our food oh no we're on fire and <laughs> that a lot of this technology is moving very quickly driven by a lot of corporate interests a lot of the time and to some of the points that have been raised without the humans involved to help with understanding some of the potential impacts, some of the things that we might really wanna be solving for. Um, some, thank you, Alice, some excellent things to both be excited about there and some things that might be a challenge. I think one note I would say, it's interesting that you bring up trust in an age of misinformation, disinformation, and the automation of misinformation, You know, looking at how AI has been used to drive conversations that aren't real people driving those conversations. The, sort of proliferation of misinformation driven by chatbots that are fake accounts that are driving people's fears and mistrust and there's a there's a whole topic maybe for a subsequent uh webinar on that and sort of looking at the role of civil society in relationship to exactly the the infodemic which has never been quite as obvious and really non-political as it has during the pandemic so another topic for another time perhaps but Richard Deb, going to you, uh, things to be excited about, things that might be of concern. And after I've got a question in the Q&A from the audience after that. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, so I will say that excited about, and not because Amdena is my company, but I've seen, and John has also experienced it firsthand, what I'm excited about is that this there's a bunch of people in this world who are super excited to come together, collaborate and solve the problems. And I wrote this article almost two years ago that the future will be driven not by governments or corporations, but by communities and people coming together, collaborating and building the solution. And that's what I think the most exciting thing that I personally have experienced. That what John said about people spending hours, weekends, evenings, you know, Sundays, Saturdays, building something that they're not directly benefiting anything, but they're building the something, coming together, working with people from across the globe. 
there cannot be anything more exciting than that actually. That we don't need to anymore rely on big money from corporates. We don't need to be, uh, uh, wait for governments to do something. We can do that and we can make the change. And I think that is as much as why is that specifically for AI? No, it doesn't have to be only on AI, but it happens more on AI because of democratization of the knowledge online courses has made that. I can tell, now I don't need to be studying in Cambridge or Stanford to get the best education. I can sit in a village in, in Africa and we had some Somalia refugees in Kenya and things like that participating. And they, they're the problem. And I remember one case when we did the PTSD, 10 of the collaborators they themselves have a PTSD and say, look, we want to be part of solving the problem. We are the users who suffer PTSD and they come together and say, we want to build the solution that we will use. And that brings the second part of this that involve the people who face the problem, not just to refine the problem statement, but actually build a solution with them. And that is possible today. And then comes the big turn. A lot of time I'm here is the bias. People say, oh, what about machines, the bias? And I say, look, the bias is not in the machines. The bias is in us, in humans. We are the one biased, not the machines are not biased. Machines is just reading the data that we train with, okay? So we are not making it worse. We are just, if you build a machine, <laughs> which is reading human data, we're just replicating human biases in a machine. So it's not like we're making the end of the world. It happened in Amazon, they built a recruitment tool, which was sexist. It was not the fault of the tool, it was just the fault of the recruiters who hire normally people and they are sexist. But there is a way that machines can de-bias that. And that's what I think the best way to de-bias the data is to involve people, again, from different walks of people who have different cognitive diversity, men, female, and who can give a different opinion and look at the data and say, okay, there are some biases in the data, so we have to de-bias the data and build a solution. In humans, we cannot do that. In humans, if I have a bias and if I'm deciding for recruiting someone, there is no way perhaps you can de-bias me because my subconscious bias will stay and I will often say, I don't have a bias, but we all have the subconscious bias. Machines have the ability that where we can de-bias the data and actually build solutions that are not biased. Humans can never do that. That's very important to realize for all of us that who complain about being biased that, well, it's not the machines, it's we are the bias and let's build solutions that are not biased. And that's what I think would be the, the that, that both I think for me are exciting, but also for everyone to understand this very, very clearly that we are going into the world where, you know, I think we will be able to build solutions that are ethical, that are, that are sound and that are also, let's say more fair, uh, and, and, and build, make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. And I think something that I hear come up is uh, more thinking these days about how we train AI to look for bias, not just sort of reinforce bias, but where can we use AI to understand where we might be biased? It's an interesting thing for us to think about in civil society. And I think uh, on the ethical side, right, to really program in those um, fact checks but then also raising some of what Alice was speaking to, I think the, the lack of data that civil society actually holds, that's something that I get very excited too. And as we all sort of inevitably march to the cloud, what begins to become more of an opportunity there as people start having their data in the cloud where it is actually more accessible. Should it be safe? Of course, there are all sorts of caveats to that. But the very fact that civil society data would be in the cloud means that there are opportunities then to start networking that data, bringing it forward, bringing forward data from communities that otherwise are invisible as they're represented only in little spreadsheets on laptops around the world. It's there, it's just not accessible. So the potential over time for civil society to become a balancing force in the data that's available, especially for government services and things like that. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, there's one here. Uh, well, we have several questions. Um, one question, uh, a concern is the potential misuse of AI, especially when we talk about scanning online conversations to generate data. NGOs rarely have the rigor for data privacy and protection protocols. So the potential that, um, in trying to solve a problem, we might be violating rights and creating another problem. That's a that's a good question, Tanishri. And I think one that he was looking for Rudradeb and Alice in particular, maybe John, you know, thinking about what is the ethical oversight on us in these situations? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump on it. <laughs> um, also, hi to Nushri, thanks for joining the conversation. Um, so I basically uh, kind of like worked in data privacy sector before <laughs> joining AI for good um, and kind of like um, have been part of like many trainings, many discussions with the regulatory bodies about, you know, how privacy should be done in ideal world what is the ethical use of data what is the ethical um, use of uh, this technology that collects the data and stuff like that so um, one thing that uh, came out of the like recent um, not so recent to be honest <laughs> legislation uh, in europe for gdpr um, is uh, this concept of privacy by design and uh, this is what we usually follow when we build technologies but it's not like just to show off and uh, say that we are the best of the best now <laughs> basically the concept like encourages every single organization um, that builds data collecting tools to build them in that um, framework which is basically um, you know whenever you interact with the user um, you first of all try to secure every single connection with them and your internal data storage places <laughs> or data processing uh, places to make sure there's no kind of way to kind of leak or breach this data anywhere so nobody can hack it. So obviously that's your key responsibility to secure and protect your user um, and their data. But also another thing is um, really important in this concept is minimization of how much data you collect. So um, as you know, Rudra Dip, <laughs> I think you might second me on that. Um, for AI and for like, you know, any type of data science uh, exercise, you don't need that many data points. You don't necessarily need every single column about, you know, their address, their name, their location, I don't know, the preferences they have in regards to this or that. You know, sometimes like it's just excessive data. Uh, that we sometimes, you know, can play with as data scientists because it's fun, you know, why not? But sometimes it's just like completely unnecessary for the task that we are dealing with. Um, so why do collect this data in the first place? So I think this is like a really important, again, in the design thinking process for your solution to kind of like step by step analyze, okay, this column or this data class, do we need it? Is it really important? Maybe we should drop it. Maybe we shouldn't collect it. So for example, in our technology, um, what we do to protect the user, because our user is super vulnerable if something get, leaks out um, about them. So we don't collect their personal ID. So we don't know their name, their store name. Uh, we don't even know their location. <laughs> we only know that it's probably this country. You know, We operate in South Africa. So most likely the majority of our users come from there. Um, we do know their preference for language because it's important for us to be able to communicate with them. We know the time zone because it's important for us to see in analytics um, when abuse usually happens, when people come to our services to better serve them at this particular time. Um, and apart from that, you know, it's just conversational data and that's it. And conversational data has to be anonymized. So in every conversation, people sometimes drop, you know, a name <laughs> or, you know, like location, like the street name or something like even the car details sometimes, who knows, whatever happens to them, maybe, you know, they were confused and were sending it to some other friend or something. So we are trying to be extra careful. So before the data goes into our system and being stored, we do make sure this, um, this important, like personally identifiable information is stripped out of it. So this is how basically you can approach this problem in your organization. Uh, but start with, you know, what data is actually important and necessary for you to collect, not the other way around. First collect and then, oh, maybe this is like unnecessary. All of the, uh, the major Silicon Valley corporations are saying, oh, don't let her talk anymore right now. <laughs> all those who are making their business on collecting all of our data all of the time. Um, question. Thank you, Alice, that, that's very helpful. Um, different question. The comment was fascinated by the importance of diversification of data or personnel to remove bias. Do you know any examples of when this problem has been successfully solved that we can all learn from? John, Ruderdeb, do you wanna, and then, uh, yeah, going to you first since Alice just answered the last one. Either of you have a, an example of that, I think about, for instance, digital data divide, if I'm not 
we can we can send a link later that if that was the right name but there there are some organizations who i know have been really working on how to help civil society clean up their data um get their data prepared for this sort of thing doing large data scraping and organizing projects but i don't know john or rudra deb do you have any examples where people have successfully sort of and explicitly worked on the diversification of data and or personnel to remove bias? Well, I'm, I don't know how, what defines successfully. So that's a question that I will kind of leave it. But I mean, to me, I will give an example of what we are doing on Dana. I mean, we we do bring that people from different parts. 40% of our collaborators are female and John have been part of it. And we don't make that that a, a, a tick box. It's actually, we see that woman, by, by if we create an equal opportunities, 40% of them are collaborators are women. Um, across six continents, uh, all represented in the challenge, across 20, 30 countries, people coming together, age group from 16 to 65. It's not just, as one said, white male of certain age. It's actually very diverse. And what we have seen, I could go on and go on so many examples, but I'll leave that is when you bring that kind of diverse group of people and give them the, the freedom to, to initiate things and do things and speak, um, that naturally creates the eth eth ethical aspect of it. And I wrote this article in the AI ethics uh, journal, and we have seen this. You know, I mean, let's say if I talk about, I'm give a very quick example that comes to my mind about PTSD. When we're working with PTSD, and the organization said we want to build, let's say, a chatbot around certain thing, and many of the collaborators pushed back and they said, look, you know, we suffer, and few of them were female. I said we suffer PTSD. We don't want to do that. Actually, we don't want to answer those questions. And there was an organization was like, oh yeah, you make sense. You know, maybe we don't. So, so once you create that diverse group, the, the people, and we have seen that, that it just, I say, becomes more ethical. Now, whether it's a success or not, well, I will consider it as a success. So that's the way we, we deal with, with data uh, rather than some expert coming in and actually de it. And why that would not work again? Because we, we all need to realize we all have subconscious bias. We all have, you know, no matter what we, how good we are, we all have. So even if, I get one expert, if I think I'm the biggest expert in a given sector, and if I get a data, I will not be able to devise this because I would bring my subconscious bias into the data. So that's it how it is. So, so, so the only way device is get people, diverse people, let them work together and, and it will be, and that's what we are trying to do. And I think we have done it perhaps successfully. I mean, you know, that's a, as I said, that's part of leave it, but yeah. Excellent point. Thank you, John. I, I want to address another question I see in the chat on um, sure. the relation of the scale of activities versus the application of AI tools. And it asks about the cost efficiency. So if uh, services that would otherwise be provided by humans are provided by technology, by AI in this case. And I, I, there's, there's a lot of talk, we've talked about how important it is to have the humans in the equation. And, and when you read medical literature of uh, uh, companies that are creating technologies, they always say, for instance, uh, in radiology and interpreting the results of medical imaging, they always say, well, you need the doctor to do the interpretation. And the reality is, uh, my friend Joel Salamitio, who's the founder of, of uh, Magpie, uh, always says that it's the people who are selling the technologies <laughs> who are saying that because AI is going to eliminate the, the person, the doctor who's interpreting those results because AI will interpret it. Um, at some point, um, at, at the end of the process, there will be a medical provider addressing the fact that you have pneumonia, but it's, it's the machine that's going to be more accurate in telling you if you have pneumonia or not. Um, so people will lose jobs in commercial settings. Uh, the, the people I think who are safer are, are those subject matter experts who understand what data needs to be looked at and how it needs to be interpreted. Um, but, but there are areas where it's much more easy to replace the human and, and medical imaging is a great example of that. Can For I sure. just add one line yeah. on that, like less than a minute. So I think that we need to redefine 
AI as being not artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. This is what I wrote in the book. And augmented intelligence means we are augmenting human intelligence with machine intelligence. It's not replacing human intelligence. It's very, very important to realize that if we as a human, we are doing a very routine work, like what John exactly said, like in looking at an image and trying to find something out, maybe that's not what we are meant to do. Our intelligence is much more sophisticated. We should be doing much better things. And the, the very routine work of looking at patterns and things, let machines do that so that we can spend our time doing other things that we are created for and we're more creative. That machines cannot do that. So, and we shouldn't be worried about it. We should be happy about that, that our, the boring work that we hate to do is going to go away and machines will take that away. And we can spend our time doing other things that we are creative. We are you know, much bigger than, than sitting on a desk and, and doing some stupid work in a way. Yeah, no, that's, <clears throat> that's a great point. And I think one that I, I know has come up around robotics, for instance, and the exact same analogous situation of we're, insta we're bringing robots into the factories, they're going to displace jobs. And the examples where robots have actually been brought into factories it creates more jobs and different kinds of jobs. People aren't lifting. I, I had an uncle who spent his entire life as a factory worker. The guy couldn't walk by the time he was old because he was lifting things in ways that no humans should ever be lifting things. He was replaced by a robot. Well, if, he, if he'd stuck with a job, he would have been replaced by a robot. And that's something to celebrate if and when to some of the points that have come up earlier, we have different ways of training people to train in to take different kinds of jobs. I think that is a relevant fear about displacement without ways of supporting people to transition to different kinds of jobs. Industrial revolutions have a way of doing that. Um, and an area where policymakers might also wanna be considerate about what jobs are being displaced and how they can ensure those folks have a future, um, economically speaking. Well, time to wrap up. Thank you for coming to AI Story Time. Um, I really appreciate all of the speakers. Uh, anyone in the in the chat, if you want to share things that you think people might read or get excited about, movies to watch that demonstrate AI in ways that you found intriguing, um, West uh, Westworld is a good one. Um, if there are different resources on civil society that you'd like to share, great things that you had as takeaways, fantastic. But for today. Thank you all for joining. I hope it's been a useful conversation to ground a little bit in sort of how people are actually working some on some of the AI challenges and opportunities in civil society right now. Kasha, did you did you have something to say to us? I see you popped up again. <laughs> yes, I can uh, wait to say thank you very much for this interesting conversation. We gathered a lot of uh, resources, external resources from Alice through Graveb. Uh, here on the chat and thank you for all Facebook comments. Uh, I will gather anything, everything in one mm, summary article, including video uh, of this webinar. And I will send it to all people who registered, but it's also on Tax of Europe website. So thank you very much again. And I hope to see you soon during the next conversation about technology for good. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. That's everyone. Thanks, Take care. Thank you. Cheers.